And we're hoping that those of you like Scott, um, who have many years of experience teaching IT, will chime in today. Uh, before we start, just a couple of um, administrative updates. Just wanted to clarify the instructional team roles. So Brooke is taking on the, the project management aspect of all of the curriculum deliverables. She's tracking deadlines, um, monitoring when deliverables come in, and doing an initial review of curriculum deliverables. Um, and she is also the primary point of contact for all things curriculum for Clover Park, Nova, Pierce College, and Renton Technical College. Nicole is the primary point of contact for Bellingham, Clark, Spokane, and Whatcom. And Michelle, after Brooke does the initial review, Michelle does a review and comment on all um, of the curricula submitted from all of you. Any questions on that? Okay, um, just a, a note about the convention for listing the ONC lectures. If you could stick to this convention that you see on the screen right now in red, that would be much appreciated. And I know some of you are using CA HIMSS content, um, but we don't need to know which section of, of CA HIMSS if you're, for example, um, just using a particular lecture in ONC in your health IT modules for your healthcare programs. Does that make sense? Brooke, I don't know if you have anything to add to that. Yeah, so um, not to the first point, Margaret, but um, to the second point, just some clarifications on questions that have been coming up um, from various member colleges as you submit all these different documents. Um, the first clarification is um, not for this particular document that's on the screen right now, but for the overview, um, program overviews for both uh, the health IT certificates and the infusion. Particularly for the infusion courses, the program overviews are just a snapshot of the program as is um, without infusion. Some of you have sent, um, sent it to me with the infusion, and that's fine. But um, just want to let you know, you don't need to include the infusion. It's just to um, submit what program you are infusing into. And then um, for the second document, Margaret will pull it up, um, the Health IT Infusion um, Module Dissemination document. Um, just a couple of clarifications. Um, a few of you have asked, uh, if we scroll down all the way to the bottom, Margaret, or actually to the next page, sorry. Um, so this page is, is commenting on the course into which you are infusing health IT content. Um, so it's actually very similar to the overview document, um, and you can just do kind of a copy and paste there. Um, if we scroll down a little bit further, to the next page. Oh, maybe I can do this. Yeah, here we are. Um, this page uh, is referring to the health IT content that you are infusing. So um, these are just, this is just for new content that you are developing. And for each module of health IT that you are creating, some of you are creating just one, some of you many. But for each module, you need to include, um, obviously, the objectives and the topics, but all the activities, uh, discussion questions, um, and assessment for each module. So not all lumped together as uh, all the infusion content that you are, that you are um, creating. Are there any questions so far about that? No? Okay. okay. Um, and just real quick about that as well. Um, these are drafts. So once you submit the drafts, um, I'll send some comments back. And as you guys get more into um, developing detailed activities, we'll be looking more at um, 
you know, making sure the assessments line up with each objective and that they're 508 compliant and, um, you know, that the objectives are clearly written and things like that. So we'll, we'll have a good back and forth for a while with these. Okay, that's all. Thanks, Brooke. Uh, I also wanted to mention that we have a website, hiteducation.org, and housed on that website are uh, documents related to curriculum, so templates and, and that sort of thing. And let me just give you a quick look at that. Okay, so that's the website. And if you go up here to HEW Member College Resources and go to Curriculum Development Resources, this is what you'll see. Activity templates, curriculum forms, information from the weekly webinars. And what we're working on now, let me go back here. Um, our, our ed tech is looking at developing a database for all of the learning activities that we create so that there'll be um, kind of learn, learning objects that we can search for, uh, all of us. So we, we can upload those and tag them, at least th this is our vision. Um, it looks promising so far that we'll be able to create this, but um, eventually, once we start collecting learning activities, here at our end, we will upload them to a database, tag them with um, you know, various keywords, and then give you access so that you'll be able to search if you're looking for something on workflow development um, or some other topic, or if you're looking for items for a medical assisting program, you'll be able to search that database uh, and find activities that you can use in your program. So we're looking forward to having that developed. Um, it's probably going to be a, a not, another four weeks or so before that happens, though. Any questions on anything we've talked about or anything else for that matter? OK, I'm going <coughs> to hand things over to Nicole. Great. Um, let's see. Where are you, Nicole? There you are. Great. Thank you, Margaret. And good afternoon, everybody. Um, uh, this week's session, we are going to talk about uh, technical training and look at it from an instructional design perspective uh, and really drilling down on activities and um, considerations when pulling together activities. Um, and as Margaret mentioned at the very beginning of this webinar, that we know that there's some folks who really do this on a day-to-day -day basis. So uh, I'm shooting for a dialogue <laughs> in this as much as possible. Um, and there'll be a couple points where I'll, I'll stop and, and, and really open it up. But please don't um, hesitate to drop something into chat or chime in along the way. Uh, and um, Technical training uh, really can span um, a wide horizon, um, but for the purposes of this webinar, we'll be thinking of it in light of the technical topics that we'll be covering, more HIT and IT related. Um, but uh, forgive me if some of my examples stray into science or mathematics or things like that. Sometimes it's, it's hard just to find that perfect piece that you want to show. So with that, um, I thought I'd start off with a question, and we can use our chat box. And if the chat box isn't accessible, just kind of go up to the top bar, um, top bar, click chat, and you should be able to um, open up the chat box or expand it and just uh, select everyone. Um, but let's think about what makes technical training different from other types of training, such as soft skills. Um, from your experience, what, what do you find are the the pivot points between technical training and soft skills, or what are the key differences? And um, go ahead and feel free to drop that into the chat box.
Hello. Oh, there we got some coming and rolling in. Um, uh, yes, Michelle um, pointed out it's more hands-on. Um, and uh, there is uh, technical training definitely lends itself to more practice activities, labs, and, and um, uh, hands-on learning. And Brooke, it's practical. <laughs> yeah, there seems to be a direct correlation between um, content covered and, um, and on-the-job uh, application. Uh, Matt, various industry standards and certificates. Yes, unfortunately, we tend to have to um, develop um, towards um, uh, kind of predefined paths of, 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 uh, of material. And uh, Margaret, more formulaic. <laughs> yes, there uh, seems to be um, a next step, next step, next step process uh, that we see. Um, and uh, Scott, we do a lot of hands-on, but still do soft skills. Scott, do you want to, um, since you, I know you do a lot of technical training, do you want to unmic and, and talk to that point a little bit? Um, as part of our advisory committee, they're requiring us to do soft skills. So as we go through and we talk about, in network engineering, <laughs> we're talking about creating users and doing all that type of stuff. We also talk about how, um, they need to communicate with users and and uh, the the disposition that they're going to be required to have and so it's we do we do a lot with soft skills um, but we also have to teach the the content area as well so gotcha gotcha no I guess that makes sense there it really is a service department as well yeah. Any other thoughts or additions on this? Okay, well, uh, excuse me, I'm, I need to cough for a moment. I'm coming off of the flu, one second. <laughs> Back online. Okay, and next slide here. Uh, so let's talk about, uh, begin with the end in mind. And as instructional designers, uh, Whenever we design training, we always ask that question, what does the learner need to know or be able to do um, at the end of the training or the end of the course? Uh, and uh, it's not uncommon for the goal of training in, as pointed out in the last slide, that the goal for training and technical training to be very hands-on. And But uh, as we do with, um, with all training, we want to make sure that our, our objectives are tied to our assessments. Um, but in technical training, there seems to be an in increased emphasis in the application of re learning rather than the knowledge application. Excuse me, acquisition. Sorry about that. I often will hear um, goals or outcomes of courses to be um, along the lines of, at the end of this course, the learners um, will be able to install and configure a Cisco router, or can build an application for data mining in Oracle database, or build a mobile learning health application. These are very real, very task-based outcomes. And um, uh, the uh, 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 let, uh, because we're really focused on task-based uh, or very measurable specific skills that we can see that translate in day-to-day -day work. And even as Scott pointed out, those can be soft skills because those are things that are going to have to, to translate. Um, we want to make sure that our objectives line up with that, um, that they are specific and measurable. Um, and they do relate directly back to topic study, studied. And we stay away from those objectives that are hard to measure. Um, things like understand basic features of the software, or identify the functions of each menu item, or feel more comfortable with the software. I call these types of objectives that seem to be a, observable and measurable, but that are still too broad, the calculate the number of grains of sand on a type of beach objective. They are, uh, they're out there, but it's not going to um, tie directly back to tasks and things that are observable on a, on a day to day basis. Uh, when training on technology, such as application or platform or authoring language or a piece of equipment, it's tempting to try to and deliver everything that the learner might need to know on the job or in the real world. 
however, this approach can lead to data dump um, of information, uh, things that are nice to know, um, uh, but not necessary uh, for really performing um, what that student is going to need out in the real world. And so instead of focusing on, uh, so instead, let's focus on the specific real world tasks that people do use in the technical field and break the ba them down into basic steps so you can identify problem areas and brainstorm practice activities. It, you know, it's hard to cover every task that the learner will need to know, but if we focus on the core, the most common ones or, or things um, that are most relevant to jobs being performed, um, uh, we can uh, uh, stay true to um, uh, the objectives and the goals for, the, uh, for that particular course. Um, and, but we do know that except, exceptions will be popping up and to deal with exceptions, we need to point out things like online resources, job aids, and other points of reference so that um, uh, if a learner does need to um, uh, perform a function that um, is non-standard, they at least know where to begin to start to um, address that type of problem. So let's talk a little bit about um, the types of technical training activities. Technical training tends to line up with the model, tell, show, do. Um, and um, the, the do part that we're going to uh, spend a few moments right now talking about and the activities that relate um, to the do with the practice activities. So let's dive into those a little bit more right now. Uh, while there's lots of, uh, of learning activities that lend itself well for technical training, I'm just going to focus on, on these three here. Work examples, simulation, and problem-based activities. Work examples. You know, we've talked um, uh, the past few months um, now and again about work examples. But work examples are when a student learns step-by-step -step how to perform a task or solve a problem. If you've ever sat through like a lynda.com um, course on, say, Photoshop, you've seen this model in action where um, you, uh, through maybe a webcast or a screencast, you watch step-by-step -step as um, the instructor uh, works through examples on, let's say, how to crop a photo or change colors in a photo. Um, so it's a very kind of standard type of activity. Uh, in work examples, fading is a way to gradually remove that instructional gu um, guidance as the learner gains exper um, expertise. And um, we'll show a few examples of L OLI um, on how they tend to do this really well, um, this model of fading out a work example. Uh, simulations. Um, are another type of uh, commonly used learning activity in, uh, in technical training. Simulations provide safe environments for students to apply and test concepts learned without major risk to themselves or, with, or others. Um, in the case of this grant, our students will not only be able to search and explore in EHR from a uh, provider perspective, but they'll actually be able to go behind the curtain and see how applications connect and share content and data. Um, uh, we're also uh, planning with the STAR EMR to be able to have opportunities for our tech students to be able to install and in uninstall um, uh, EHR components. Uh, and so being able to do that in a, a safe environment doesn't mean that uh, data gets lost or um, uh, any sort of uh, situation with a patient gets compromised, um, but it also prepares them to go live um, at a pretty high rate of experience uh, when the time comes. And finally, problem-based activities. Uh, these present opportunities for learners to apply concepts covered to help solve real-world problems. Uh, uh, problem-based activities are actually used a lot in the ONC materials. Uh, for any of you who've spent any time kind of taking a little bit of deep, uh, a deeper dive into components 7, 8, and 11, those are the components that deal with the Vista VA um, 
uh, EHR application, you'll notice that there are a lot of problem-based activities giving you kind of like a scenario to go out and look for information or given this piece of information, how would you do X, Y, and Z? Um, and I threw this schematic up here, this network schematic, because we'll often see that in kind of tech stuff. How would you, let's say, identify data and load issues on an expanding hospital network? And so these are uh, really rich learning opportunities that directly apply concepts um, that are being covered in material um, and uh, into potentially real-world scenarios. Um, what other uh, type of uh, learning activities um, are you using um, in your certificate courses um, as you design them, or, or Scott, uh, that you use with your students? We're currently going through, um, for the, the mobile side of it, we're trying to figure out how to, there's no simulation software as far as we can find um, to do it, so what we're going to end up doing is having them work through a virtualized environment, um, either through uh, VMware Workstation or, or some free uh, virtualization software, and then they can actually run the the operating system out of it and, and take screenshots um, as they work through the, the different assignments. Um, the simulation software I've had issues with strictly because of the fact that a lot of it, it's designed designed by someone else first off. Second of off, it tends to limit what you can do, if that mm -hmm. makes sense. Yep. It, it, it's I, <coughs> our um, computer literacy class, we use uh, a program that allows you to go through and and work through Office, but it's certain things that you can do one way in Word, it won't let you do through the simulation software, so um, that can become frustrating for students. But we're, I mean, the the problem-based activities where you give them problems, they got to go through and, and uh, work through virtualized environments to uh, to basically solve solve the issues that are there is is a lot of what we do. And Scott, this is Margaret. Can I ask you a question about that? How how do you um, assess whether they know how to do it or not? Do you just ask them to take screenshots? The basically we have labs that they have to kind of work their way through. Mm -hmm. um, and then as they get to certain steps, we have them take screenshots. Um, okay. And then for assessments, uh, you know, we've got the, the typical multiple guess, true, false type stuff, but we also have um, a lot of hands-on practical tests where they have to go through and, and configure something. Um, we actually have a, a virtual server environment here where our students are able to connect through a VPN to uh, configure servers and workstations and that type of stuff. And so we can actually go in, have them configure stuff, and then we can go back into their uh, their workstation and, and check to see that they've uh, completed the tasks and done it correctly. Um, the other one that I've seen, um, I have not found a, a great way to uh, to submit it is there is the option where you can have them go through and, and basically video record what's going on on their computer. Mm -hmm. And then you sit and, and watch as they move through the, the different steps. Um, and then you can, can see that they're actually uh, performing the steps correctly. Um, those yeah, what do you think about that from an <laughs> instructor standpoint? Because we, we were knocking those ideas around like, hmm, which is more painful to cr to correct exactly. as an instructor? Is it, <laughs> yeah. is it looking at the screenshots or is it looking at the recordings? Hmm. Um, the recordings would, <laughs> it would take forever. Um, screenshots aren't okay. bad. Um, we do that through a lot of our, our classes. Um, I also, one of the other big issues that we have is documentation um, within the network area, and so 
um, our students not only have to give us screenshots, but they have to document exactly what they've did, uh, what they've done, answer some questions as they go through, um, and then reflect back on what they've what they've done. Scott, would you be able to share um, just by email over the next couple of weeks a, a couple of examples of that sort of thing? Um, because I know you you have a lot more experience than most of the rest of us in uh, IT training. I can do that. Thank you. And yeah, and any any general tips that you have, you know, where you've seen uh, non-IT instructors try to teach IT and where you go, oh, don't do that. <laughs> yeah, that's the, the tough part is sometimes it works for, for some and the other one I found out is depending on what learning management system you have, it, some things are are easier in one than they are in another. We just, I switched to, to Canvas from Angel beginning, no, last spring. Um, mm -hmm. I tried one class last spring and I found that Canvas works considerably better with um, Word documents than Angel does because for me to go through and grade my my stuff through Angel was taking me, I don't know, three times as long because every time you opened up a, a, a assignment that someone put in a Dropbox, it would take you, I don't know, 30 seconds or so. Oh, yeah. And mm -hmm. Canvas literally just pops up within seconds. So um, it all... All kind of depends on on what you're using and and how huh. you're using it. But uh, yeah, I'll go. I'll send you that stuff. Great, thank you. Great. That um, that is. It's nice to have a resident expert <laughs> in our ranks. Um, uh, the next um, part of what I was going to cover today um, were kind of considerations when creating activities for technical content. I have to admit, when I was thick, um, I kept coming across um, the Clark Mayer stuff time and time again on uh, when it comes to working with multimedia. And I, I'm hearing uh, someone else talking right now. If, if you're not chatting, uh, if you're not going to speak up right now, perhaps you can mute your microphone. Um, and uh, it, it, and when I was uh, researching this, a lot of the, the principles and the thoughts about m working with multimedia and what are good practices often came back to things that were really applicable for technical training. So kind of the core of what I'm going to cover right here it may sound familiar. We've referred to them in perhaps other ways, but I wanted to pull out specific examples. Um, so the first one is mirror the job. This um, Whenever possible, create opportunities for learners that have actual practice time in real-world environments, even to simulate it. And I think Scott just mentioned that beautifully with um, talking about the virtual machines and going back in and, and actually looking at what students had created. Um, uh, it, it, it's direct hands-on experience and, and probably the, the best opportunity we can give students. And um, this next one, I'm going to pull up a. a uh, a website, um, OLI, and it's the Principles of com uh, Computing, and I want to point out these three points right here. And one second while I share my desktop, I think it'll be the way to do it. And great. Um, hopefully you can all see this right now. This is the OLI, um, the Carnegie Mellon's Open Educational Resources, the Principal Commu of Computing um, course. And um, what I wanted to point out is, is they, uh, they're, there's a bit of the gold standard when it comes to uh, integrating um, learning activities, practice activities within a course lesson. And we're just we're not going to take it too deep of a dive, but I just want to point out structure. Right up here we got our learning objective. So we know what we're going to be talking about. And we have a, a little bit of the lesson. And then we start this is um, 
this is the beginning of a worked example right here um, and how they start to uh, fill this example out. They work it through and then we now have a, um, a practice um, uh, activity. And so the, it's distributed throughout the course here. It's not just right at the end. Um, and I am not even going to attempt to <laughs> complete this. I'm, I'm just going to try to put, I don't even know if I should put a number or a letter. Um, we'll try number 15 and see what happens, if anything. Um, oh, well, that worked. Um, shockers there. Um, and, well, there is our provide corrective feedback. Um, apparently, it was unnecessary since I really know what I'm talking about in this example. Um, but we also have um, hints. Uh, and now the, uh, the best one <laughs> to show here since everything is correct. Um, congrats to me on that. But um, it, I wanted to show that it's great to be able to include a practice exercise with that corrective feedback. So had a person gotten it wrong, um, um, we would uh, see um, uh, we would see opportunities to help kind of correct our performance along the way, and then um, we go back to a more work more worked examples, and then another opportunity to practice. And so I uh, I love pointing to the OLI stuff just because. Uh, it never fails. They really deliver on what is kind of best practices when it comes to um, uh, online learning. And now I am going to uh, go back to um, uh, stop sharing. There we go. Great. I think we're back. Yes, perfect. We're back to the slides here. Thanks for my navigation right there. And now let's talk about managing cognitive load. Um, in some of the earlier webinars, we've, we've mentioned um, cognitive load. And particularly in worked examples, um, it to, for them to be effective, they need to be structured, uh, well structured, uh, so that, that extraneous information doesn't impact the learners. And things like hints. Um, can help learners by jogging short-term memory and glossary um, that you know that uh, to look up key terms uh, uh, can help the learners by not, um, allowing them not have to keep tons of supporting information in their mind as long as they know where they can go to say oh gosh you know what is um, in, uh, a circular fraction they can click on it, get that definition, and go back to their practice activity. We're finding ways to manage cognitive load in everything that we do these days. Just look at Google Maps. We don't need to know any more street names how to get to a place. We just put in the address, and there we go. We don't, it, we're allowed to focus on things that are important. And this approach is really helpful when designing technical activities where the content itself is fairly complex um, and even the language um, used in the material is complex. Um, by creating avenues for the learner to get answers really quickly, just in time, and allowing them to focus on the activity um, is, a, is a great strategy to keep in mind as you design activities. And Present material in manageable chunks. This is also kind of known as segmenting. But um, it, it's, it's always helpful when we um, create courses to think about how can we break content down. If we have a large topic, how do we break it into those um, digestible bite-sized chunks? And wanted to show you a, whoop, did it pop up here? Oh, maybe not. Um, Oh well, I was going to show you a screenshot, I guess it didn't load in here correctly, of a uh, course that had been broken it down into segments um, where each topic, uh, where uh, a topic was broken out into components. Um, but think about how can I break down a really large um, topic into something that the learner can digest and relate back to things that perhaps they already know to make those connections so that it will stick in long-term memory. And seven, define technical terms before the lesson. 
Um, once again, this is from that intro to computing class. Uh, and before we even launch right into a lesson, um, we talk about some of the key terms um, that will be popping up um, uh, throughout the lesson, algorithms and objects, uh, and what those definitions mean in light of com com uh, computing. And uh, finally, um, present key topics, uh, concepts, before covering processes. And this is also a uh, pre-training uh, principle, if you will. It's help gearing the learner up so that they, when they hit the core parts of the lesson, they'll be ready to go. Um, so it's about introducing the fundamentals, the building blocks, um, uh, to uh, the systems and process that will be covered in more detail in the lesson. And I've highlighted the box here. Uh, once again, this is also taken from the Intro to Computing um, class. And the, I think this first line here, one of the fundamental techniques used in computation is the principle of iteration. And so we're going to drill down right at the beginning about things that are going to become building blocks for uh, the processes that are going to be covered in more detail in that lesson. Uh, we see this a lot uh, in uh, biology. You know, if you think of things like uh, the discussions about the digestive system. Well, before we can understand how the digestive system works, we need to think about the components that make up, up it, um, that comprise the digestive system um, before we can dive into it. And um, finally, uh, use text for reference content. This kind of goes back to managing cognitive load. Um, but um, think about ways where you can uh, keep reference content, um, that just-in-time information accessible um, to the learner. Uh, if you're using, you know, uh, voiceover, um, typically we, we say use, you know, voiceover and not text at the same time. But when it comes to English as a, uh, as a second language students, um, or um, extremely complex con content like we find in technical, think about how you can augment your core material with, um, with resources that provide um, content and, uh, uh, and reference just when the student needs it. So these are some of the kind of things to kind of keep in mind as you start to pull together learning activities. Um, for your technical certificate program, um, but would love to open it up right now and hear what's worked for you or, or maybe even, you know, something you tried and were surprised it went great or surprised that it didn't work well. We'd love to hear about your experiences right now. And Scott, I know you got not, yeah, not to yes. put Scott on the spot yes. again, but if you have any any tips to offer the rest of us on some common pitfalls to avoid or anything like that, um, hope you'll speak up. Or anybody else? Well, we'll look forward to sharing um, the examples that Scott is going to send us, which will circulate to you. And I also wanted to give you an update on EMR Star, the academic uh, EMR access tools that we're developing as part of the grant. Um, they are ahead of schedule. So um, we'll be doing the unveiling of the the first piece in EMR star so in, I'm not sure how much you all know about EMR star but the the ultimate goal <coughs> is to provide access to multiple EMR systems a couple of them will be open source and um, some of them will be proprietary uh, but eventually by the end of the grant students will have access to multiple platforms that they and lab activities that they can use to work through the different platforms. So we're looking at scheduling um, a faculty orientation to the, the first system that will be available in EMR STAR. We're looking at um, an afternoon 
the week of May 20th and an afternoon the week of May 27th. Probably it'll be about an hour and a half long and we're looking at scheduling about two in the afternoon. So um, if you all could give me a response in the chat box about if any of that, that those time frames do not work for you, that would be great. So again, that's um, a day during the week of May 20th. We haven't landed on the exact date yet. And um, a session, a, a repeat session, the week of the 27th. Yes, so, the, and we will be avoiding a Memorial Day and we'll be avoiding the Friday before Memorial Day. Oh, Vivian, um, it's a good question about whether they'll have PACs in EMR STAR. We're assuming that there'll be some provision for that in the hospital system, at least. Um, the initial one that'll be available will just be an outpatient practice, so I'm not sure, but I will ask. Okay. Nicole, did you have anything else to add? No, no. I um like I said I'm I'm uh, or you mentioned Margaret, I'm eager to see what Scott has to share. I'm I I love learning about this. This is such a, a pertinent topic to all the work we're doing on this grant. So, um thanks everybody for your time today. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you, Nicole. Thank you. All right. Take care thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.